Hello and welcome to the lecture for topic four, which focuses on gender and the right to vote. Okay, so what are we gonna look at in this lecture? First, we're gonna look at the foundations and the role that political participation plays in a democracy. Next, we're gonna look at the varied reasons for why women sought the right to vote and why some women opposed the ratification of the 19th Amendment. We're going to look at the this uh, idea called the woman's vote or the women's voting bloc, and we're going to see that it does emerge, but it doesn't emerge until well after the passage of the 19th Amendment. So the idea that when women got the right to vote, that they would vote in really high numbers and they would vote differently than men, that didn't happen, and we're going to examine why. And then we're going to conclude by taking a look at the, the way that this voter block has in fact emerged. Um, and we'll begin the process of looking at this thing called the gender gap, in particular in voting, sort of setting the stage for what we're gonna be learning about next week. So democracy rests on the principle of popular sovereignty. And so as we know, democracy is rule of the people, government of, for, and by the people. And democracy rests on this notion that the people are the ones who are sovereign, that political power and political decision-making ultimately is vested in the people. And that's what popular sovereignty is. Now, how do we know what the people in a democracy want? what their, the will of the people is. Well, the main that way that we do that is by giving people political rights. Um, and that those political rights are fundamentally the right to vote. But there are other political rights that we have as well. The right to join a political party, the right to run for office, the right to uh, participate in direct actions like protests or other sorts of actions like joining an interest group and lobbying an interest group um, or, or joining an interest group and having the interest group lobby decision makers. All of those are examples of political rights, but the fundamental one is the right to vote. To live in a true democracy, um, political rights must be extended to all citizens that live within the territory. Um, if you if you live in a country that um, extends those political rights only to certain groups, um, such as men or um, certain racial groups or only those who are wealthy or whatever that category may be, your country is not truly a democracy. So how we evaluate the amount of democracy that exists in a country is by looking at how full uh, Lee, the political rights are extended. So that sort of sets the stage for why women were um, uh, demanding the right to vote, just as African Americans demanded the right to vote following the, um, the Civil War. Now, a couple of things you should keep in mind about, uh, about um, political rights. So it says there that political rights are, should be extended to all citizens. Um, but keep in mind that who is considered a citizen of the United States is a, a product of politics. And so uh, prior to the Civil War and the passage of the 14th Amendment, uh, that African Americans were not considered citizens. Um, with the passage of the 14th Amendment, which followed the Civil War, African Americans were granted birthright citizenship. Um, that women were considered citizens, but as we know from the case Minor v. Happenstance, um, we know that women, although they were considered citizens, they were not granted the right to vote. Um, and, and, and also Native Americans, Asian Americans, et cetera, did not, were not recognized as citizens, even if they were born in the United States, um, it, it, until the end of the 19th century and the early parts of the 20th century. And so who's considered a citizen is a product of politics, okay? Um, and the rights that are um, granted to citizens is also a, a product of politics. So remember, politics is struggling for power, right? It's struggling to um, influence those who lead us and the policies that are passed. 
Uh, and so those who have political power are able to have more say over who gets defined as being a citizens. And those who have political powers have more of a, a, an ability um, to extend voting rights and other kinds of political rights. And so you can see that the women's um, uh, uh, fight for getting voting rights is wrapped up into some of these um, fundamental notions and concepts that are um, key to living in a democratic society. Okay. So you'll be reading in your textbook about how the struggle for women's suffrage um, was long and the people who fought for the right to vote for women, that's what the word suffrage mean means. Suffrage doesn't mean like suffering. Suffrage is just another word for the right to vote. And so you'll learn in this chapter and in the other readings that it was um, uh, the right for women to vote was fought for for a long time. And the people who fought for that were a diverse group of people. Um, so that the, the right to vote uh, started, uh, it was about a, a, a 70 year long struggle. Uh, keep in mind that the 19th Amendment was not ratified until 1920. Um, but as your textbook will point out that the um, starting point of the women's suffrage demands for voting rights uh, started in 1848 um, and, and really earlier than that as well. Um, historians sort of mark it at this point, but women were involved in voting and politics in colonial America uh, and, and moving forward. Um, but it was the Seneca Falls um, Convention where women came together uh, in order to um, uh, demand that they be treated equally. And you'll be watching a great video that shows you the impact of and the goals of the Seneca Falls Convention. They wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, which was based on the Declaration of Independence, the document that was written to declare our independence from Great Britain. Uh, the Declaration of Sent Sentiments is the similar Declaration of Independence, uh, but it's a declaration of women seeking independence from, um, from patriarchy. And so uh, the, that it's a mass movement and it, 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 it takes a long time to get the right to vote. Um, as you'll see in the Declaration of Sentiments and in the previous slide that we were just talking about, that the struggle for women's suffrage is rooted in the founding principles and the, 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 the uh, ideas that underpin our political culture in the United States. And so this idea that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights um, that come from something other than government, right? That, that we're endowed with those just by virtue of being human. And women embrace that um, in terms of saying that, look, our founding documents say that people have natural rights, why would women be somehow excluded from that? And that these universal rights expand to all citizens, a sort of expansive understanding of rights and liberties. And so the women's suffrage movement is an extension of the, the fight for independence and freedom that is at the basis of the founding of this country. Um, it's also, uh, the suffrage movement is also, uh, uh, has very strong ties to the abolition movement in the United States. And so in both of the videos that you'll watch, you'll see that there is a strong interrelationship between women fighting for the right to vote, but women also becoming politically active in the fight to end slavery. Um, and so uh, it's this political movement that is um, motivated by um, other political movements in the United States. Uh, keep in that mind that the women fighting for and against suffrage, they were not a, a homogenous group of people, um, that they were heterogeneous, they were complex, they were flawed, and you'll be reading all about it in the articles for this week. Um, and so uh, that you, you have uh, wealthy white women who are fighting for the right to vote, um, and you'll see that folks like Susan B. Anthony um, did not support the 15th Amendment that extended the right to vote to African-American men because she thought wealthy, white, educated women should come first. But we also have people like Ida B. Wells and Sojourner Truth um, uh, who, uh, you know, spring forth from the abolitionist movement who also fight um, hard for the uh, women's uh, suffrage. And so it's a complex and interesting group of people. Okay, 
So building off of the idea of that it was a complex and, and heterogeneous group of people who were fighting for the right to vote, um, let's look at the two main different goals that the uh, women who are seeking the right to vote, uh, what were the goals that motivated them? Well, one goal uh, and one major reason was um, that getting the right to vote was viewed as the first step towards um, gender equality. Um, that from this perspective, women argued that you cannot be truly equal if you cannot vote, um, mostly because you're going to be seen as a second class citizen. That when decisions are made, your voice is not, um, you are not asked what your opinion is on a, on, on a particular decision or policy that's being put forth or uh, a candidate who is running for office. And as long as you don't have the right to express yourself at the ballot box, you're going to be viewed as a second class citizen. So getting the right to vote equalizes that and moves women up into the same class of citizenship as, uh, as men. Um, they also thought that getting the right to vote would open the door to a fuller participation in other aspects of politics and government. Now, women were already involved in a lot of political movements, um, the abolition movement, the temperance movement, uh, the social progressive movement before getting the right to vote. Um, and so they were involved in those political grassroots movements. Um, but they felt that getting the vote would give them even more power in terms of political participation, because not only would they get the right to vote, but having the right to vote would open the door to hold elective elected office in other roles with, within government. So it was the first step towards a broader uh, path. It was first step uh, towards the path of uh, pl general political equality. Um, in this group, uh, those who um, see the vote as a step towards gender equality, they did not see big differences between men and women. Um, this group, uh, they uh, who are focused more on gender equality, they saw that women and like men were a diverse um, group and had different pers political perspectives. Um, and so their thinking was that, yeah, women will get the right to vote just like men, but they won't vote as a block. Just like all men don't vote one way, women aren't gonna vote all one way either. And so what will happen is you'll have more voters, but you won't have more of a certain type of voters. And so that was sort of their argument for why we needed to ratify the 19th Amendment. Another reason for um, seeking the right to vote, another, another group that sort of had a different reason for the ratification of the 19th Amendment was, um, it's sometimes just known as the reason is the women's voting block, okay? Um, a voting block is a group that's motivated by common concerns. They sort of vote together. Um, and uh, that from this perspective, you say, give women the right to vote because they're gonna bring something special to politics. And so this group um, saw women's vote as a special vote. Um, for them, they argued that women were closer to social issues um, because they uh, had spent more time with children, um, that they were had sort of a natural proclivity towards issues of um, where people are suffering or in pain or lacking nutrition, that there's something about being a woman that makes you more heightened to those sorts of social inequalities. Um, and that women uh, were more moral than men. Um, and so that the thinking was, is if you give women the right to vote, um, that they will um, uh, elect people uh, that are, um, will uh, follow through on their issues of social concern and they'll elect people that will bring more of a moral voice to, um, to politics in general. Um, their argument wasn't that women are going to get the right to vote and then women are going to run for office and the women are going to bring these issues to the table. Their um, thinking, their, their argument was that if you give women the right to vote, they will uh, elect men to address these social issues and these issues of, of, uh, of morality. 
Um, this viewpoint really dovetails into popular political movements at this time period. As I mentioned in the previous slide, women were already in, involved in grassroots movements that um, looked at uh, the progressive movement to alleviate poverty and hunger um, within our society. Uh, and, and so that there were that pop that political movement that women were involved in uh, was already alive and well. And they said, if you elect women, you'll get more men uh, in in office that are concerned with those progressive politics. Um, also, in the morality issue, women were involved in the temperance movement. Um, the temperance movement was the movement to forbid um, and prohibit, like prohibition, uh, alcohol. Uh, because women saw the uh, the dangerous effects of of men uh, being drunk and coming home and beating them and the children and not able to bring money back uh, that they would lose their job, uh, and so they 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 you know uh, said give women the right to vote and we will clean up our act uh, in part because we'll get rid of alcohol. So the voting rights path was a path to influence from this perspective. It wasn't a path to give us the right to vote and then it's the, the next step is we're going to run for office and you know we're going to get involved in government and we're going to get full political equality. That's not what this group was saying. Um, they want women to influence politics. They don't want it. Uh, they don't want the vote to lead to full participation in politics. So I want you to think about those two perspectives. Um, the, the first perspective that the right to vote gives women full um, political equality on the pathway to full gender equality. And the second reason being that women are kind of a special voting uh, block and you wanna bring their concerns about uh, social uh, disorder, inequality, poverty, and immorality, uh, you want to bring them to the table to make our country a better place to live in. So thinking about those two per, uh, approaches to making an argument in favor of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, go back to that time period and, and think to yourself, which of those two groups do you think you would have aligned with? Um, and think about it in terms of which do you think, which group do you think would be more politically persuasive? Do you think the first group that was um, fighting for gender equality would have been the more persuasive reason to ratify the 19th Amendment? Or do you think the women as a special vote group would have been more politically persuasive? Or maybe neither. Something to think about as we move towards our midterm exam, a question like that, what, something like that would appear on it. Now, this week, you're going to also be reading not about the women who fought for the right to vote, but you're going to be reading about women who did not want the 19th Amendment to be ratified. And they were, so as it says down there, don't forget about the antis. Because the antis were the anti-suffragettes. Uh, they were the women who fought against the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, and so again, women are a diverse group. We saw that in our last chapter as we were, um, as you guys were debating the passage of the ERA um, the Equal Rights Amendment. You had some women who were strongly in support of it, but you had another group of women who were strongly opposed to it. And you see that same thing play out in the 1920s. Um, what I have up there are just some, uh, you know, postcards. And so as you look through some of the articles we're reading this week, you're going to see that there were postcards and buttons and banners that were created in support of the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Well, there were also buttons and banners and postcards that were created opposed to the 19th Amendment. And, and, and here are just a couple um, that I came across. Um, you'll see in these that on the, on the, on the left-hand side uh, and the right-hand side, right, there was a big fear that if you gave women the right to vote, that it would um, sort of, that women would become like men and so the postcard on the, the left or on the right hand side shows a woman um, in a cop's outfit. And instead of having a, a bully stick, right, like a cop's nightstick, they have a, 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 a rolling pin for baking, right? But it's sort of this idea, oh, you give a women right to vote before you know it, they're going to become cops. And then they're going to be like this kind of weird amalgamation of a cop that has a, a, a rolling pin, right? It's sort of like, hey, don't, don't ratify the 19th. On the other side, you see that postcard where it's a guy who's dressed up like a woman holding two babies. 
And in the background, it says, you know, it says that women deserve the right to vote and to be in government in that little circle there. And so there is this real sense that if you give women the right to vote before you know it, guys are going to be sort of feminized and left at home because their suffragette wives are out there, um, you know, making a difference in the world. And that's really capsulized in that um, middle card that says suffragette Madonna. And basically, it's like men now are women and they're the ones who are going to have to feed the babies. Um, um, and so there is a vibrant anti-suffragette movement in the United States, and it wasn't men who were involved in that, but it, it was uh, women who were involved in it. Uh, they were concerned that the ballot was a burden, that it would corrupt them, it would unsex them, it would take away their liberties that they had as, as women. Um, and they also just thought that the political world was grubby and dirty and immoral, um, and they didn't want women... Um, they didn't want to be involved in that and they didn't want other women involved in it either. Um, so just, uh, you know, again, uh, we are large and complex and filled with diversity. Okay, so the 19th Amendment is ratified in 1920 um, and this is the 100th year anniversary of the uh, ratification of the 19th Amendment and the articles that you're reading are a reflection of that. Um, but after the 19th Amendment is ratified, you know, there was a sense that when women got the right to vote, that they would really turn out to vote and that they would make a difference in politics. Um, and that didn't happen. Uh, so you're going to be reading a whole article about the impact of the uh, 19th Amendment uh, on, on voting. And the predicted women's block of women voters, it, it didn't manifest itself. Um, women did not have high rates of voter turnout. Um, uh, and when they did vote, um, they didn't vote differently. They often voted just like their husbands did. Um, and so it, 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 this, you know, fear or hope that women would make this difference in, in the voting booth that did not manifest itself. Um, at least initially, uh, and in a second, we'll talk about how it didn't manifest itself until the 1980s. The question is, 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 is why, um, why did it, uh, it, why did women not show up to vote? And, and you're going to be reading a lot about that in the articles, um, that you, uh, uh, that are assigned for this week. Um, you know, one reason is that, that historians have looked at, like, like any new group of people that get the a new right to vote, it takes them a while to get sort of enculturated into voting, okay? Um, and so um, we saw that when we extended the right to vote to um, those who are 18, you used to have to be 21 or your state could prohibit you from voting in, in, unless you were 21 uh, until the 1970s when we had the Vietnam War, we amended our constitution. Um, well, it it's young folks still don't vote at the same rate as, as older folks. And so when you, you know, when you add a whole bunch of people to voting, it takes them a while to get the habits of voting. Um, and we see that same thing with, with women. And just because you have the political right to vote doesn't mean that you have the social right to vote. Uh, and so there were other, um, now for African-American women who got the right to vote, right? Well, there were a whole series of barriers that were placed in, in front of uh, African-American women as there were African-American men. Uh, African-Americans don't really get the right to vote, the full right to vote, until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. So for African-American women, um, there were huge barriers that prevented their participation in politics. Um, but um, uh, white women uh, also uh, faced social barriers as well. Um, it was not seen as appropriate for women to participate in politics, to go and vote. They, and women themselves didn't feel like it was appropriate. So it takes a while to get rid of those kinds of uh, social um, uh, constrictions on the right to vote. So what is the impact of the 19th Amendment? Um, and this is a summary of some of the things you'll re be reading in the article. Well, one of the impacts is women get the right to vote, and we'll see that impact obviously manifest um, about 60 years later. Um, but just because women didn't initially uh, turn out to vote in strong numbers doesn't mean that the 19th Amendment didn't have an impact. 
uh, one thing that the 19th Amendment did was that it upended the masculine conception of politics. Uh, politics was seen as the realm of men. The house and home were the realm of women. But now that women could vote, they had a legal right to uh, participate in politics. And even though it took a very long period of time, that um, slowly but surely as more women get involved in politics, politics is no longer seen as the, uh, of the masculine domain. Although, let's keep it real, uh, we've never had a, a, a female president. Um, and we are potentially, maybe, uh, go, going to uh, elect our first female um, vice president. It's, but anything can happen in the upcoming election, so we're not sure. Uh, and so even though it does upend that masculine conception of politics, that uh, conception is still alive and well. Uh, another thing that the 19th Amendment does is that it, it gives women a more direct connection to the political system. And the one article that you can read from The Mischiefs of Factions, um, that they talk about how women were just indirectly involved in politics, um, that they tried to influence their husband or they would get involved in social movements, but they couldn't directly elect people and they couldn't directly elect people to support particular policies. That changes obviously with the 19th uh, um, Amendment. Women are now directly connected to the political um, system. It sparked attention in the social issues that were associated with suffrage, such as the progressive social movements, as well as of temperance, and prior to the Civil War, the abolition movement. And it just makes America more dem democratic. And here we don't mean democratic like the Democratic Party. Um, but going back to that first slide when we talked about the importance of political participation and full um, enfranchisement of the citizens of a, a country that calls itself a democracy, um, the 19th Amendment takes us one step close, closer to being a more small-D democratic country. So the women's voting bloc does emerge. Um, but it doesn't emerge until the 1980s, and we'll be learning more about that um, in next week's um, lesson. So um, today there is a, a significant voting difference be between men and women. Um, it wasn't until the 1980s, so it took until the 1980s to have voter turnout, that is the rate that men turn out to vote compared to the rate that women turn out to vote. That's what voter turnout is. Uh, it wasn't until 1980 that women turned out at the same rate as men did. Um, but in 1980 that happens and today um, that more women vote. Women have a higher voter turnout rate than men. And so um, that, you know, we begin to see this difference in terms of voting between men and women. Uh, one of the big differences is that women are more likely to vote. In the 2016 election, uh, that uh, uh, women voted at a, had a 63% uh, turnout rate. So that means for every 100 women who are eligible to vote, um, 63 of them showed up to vote. Uh, men's uh, turnout was good, but not as good as women. So for every um, 100 men, uh, 59 of them would sh show up to vote. Uh, a four point difference. Uh, and, and we're gonna be learning next week that, that that's a, 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 a huge difference because there are actually more women in the United States than there are men. Uh, so if you can get the women's vote, uh, that it, your, it's, your chances at electoral success uh, increase quite significantly. Another thing that we're gonna be learning about is um, after 1980, up until 1980, um, men and women voted pretty similarly. There, um, equal numbers of men voted for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It wasn't like all women voted Democrats or all women or most women voted for the Republicans. Um, it was split pretty evenly. There wasn't a lot of partisan differences between men and women. Well, we know that ain't the case anymore. Um, women are much more likely to be aligned with the Democratic Party. Um, and uh, and uh, that we saw that even stronger in the 2018 midterm elections 
And I bet my bottom dollar that you're going to see that um, that strength of women voting for the Democratic candidate is likely to increase. Now, that's not all women. OK, uh, white women in particular continue to vote for the Republican Party. But when you look at it in aggregate, women are more likely to support Democrats. Um, and we're going to be learning, too, about uh, not just the gender gaps that we have in voting, but we have gender gaps in opinion as well. And so we'll be exploring and they begin doing that kind of exploration in um, at the end of the reading uh, in the chapter um, for this week. Um, and so um, all of this is known as the so-called gender gap. There's a gap in terms of women more likely to vote than men. There's a gap in that women are more likely to vote for Democrats than Republicans. And there's a gap on particular um, political issues that we'll be taking a look at in more detail. Okay, um, that's it for this week. Make sure to watch the other two videos that I have posted because questions from the quiz will be on, on the uh, lecture quiz will be on it. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Talk to you later.